Good evening. Welcome to another Jesus on Prophecy seminar. It's good to see you all this evening. I want to remind you about our unsealing Daniel study that we'll be doing starting uh, a week from tomorrow night, October 22nd. This will be our small group study, continued study, continued learning of some of the topics that we've been going over at a slower pace. And I think it will be very helpful to all of us. So if, if you'd like to come, please sign up out in the lobby. There's two sign-up sheets there. And that way we can also make sure we have enough materials for all that want to come. Each night we've been doing our balanced living health presentations. And we've been very blessed to have each one of these presentations. And tonight, Sister Jasmine will be sharing with us our feature for tonight. Hello. Our presentation tonight is called Creating Connections. Why Relationships Matter. Friends, who needs them? We all do. Have you ever felt the need for a friend? Maybe you have some great news, some happy things you want to share, or you may have some trials, some things that are happening that you're scared about and you want to share them with a friend. So we all need friends for good times and bad times. Friends bring fun and laughter into our lives. We turn to friends for counsel, for courage, and for compassion. A review of 148 studies on social ties found that people with strong social relationships were 50% less likely to die than people without such support. A study of more than 300 people showed that a lack of social relationships was equivalent to smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day. Wow. In terms of heart health and lifespan. Social isolation can be very damaging to both physical and mental health. God created us for relationships. When God created man, he said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Genesis 2, 18. Social connectedness is linked to living happier, longer lives, Fewer mental and emotional problems, less depression, better overall health. So how do we create positive connections in our lives? Let's look at seven ways. The first one is just to show up. Let's say there's a potluck at church or at work or a picnic, just show up. The more people that see you, and the more they will be inclined to get to know you. Just showing up at social functions on a regular basis increases likability. The exposure effect draws people together. Say yes to the invitation. Show up for the event. Smile. Be the first to say hello. Take an interest. Create a comfortable environment by listening, taking an interest in others, and making them feel special. Don't just be talking about yourself all the time. Take an interest in the other person. 
People love to talk about themselves, so let them do that. And they'll think you're the best listener. So again, smile. Be the first to say hello when you meet someone. Make an effort to remember names. I know that's tough. Does anybody have a good tip that they use to remember names? How about giving us an example how you do it? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Be curious about the interests of others. Don't spill your beans. Have you ever met someone and in the first five, ten minutes you know everything about them? <laughs> and you're thinking, oh, she's weird or he's weird. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't share too much too fast. Share general interests first, taking time to cultivate each level of friendship. Start out with easy conversations about food, music, hobbies, work. As your friendship grows, conversations may become deeper. Be yourself. Be genuine open and honest about yourself and your aspirations. Be realistic. No one, no one friend can meet all of your needs. Appreciate that your friends will have different strengths and weaknesses. Invest in friends. Take time to be together. We can be friendly with everyone, but we cannot be close friends with everyone. It appears that Jesus had about 12 or so close friends and three very close friends. It takes time to, ve to, de to develop and grow friendships. Have you taken the time to invest in three very close friends? One person cannot meet all your needs, nor is it possible Be accepting. A health of friendship means giving as well as taking. Forgiving, forgiveness and challenging each other to grow. No one is perfect. Commit to learn and grow together. Be invested. Shared relationships add meaning to life but they take time, even a lifetime, to grow and develop. Sharing your joys with your birth of your baby or your grandbaby or even an animal, weddings, trips, tragedies, successes, illnesses, meals, and even everyday activities such as walking together or shopping add meaning, memories, and value to life. Do you want a friend? who will never fail you? Jesus Christ is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. This is one friend who will always be with you and will never, ever fail you. I will never leave you, neither will I forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5. Jesus is perfect in love present at all times, and powerful to save. Will you accept him as your friend and guide and allow him to cultivate healthy relationships in your life? If yes, please raise your hand. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister. Sister Jasmine. Well, it's now time for our special gift drawing. Dwight, do you have some numbers there? I do. All right. How about we give out t two gifts again tonight? I like that. Right. I like giving out gifts. <laughs> Go ahead. I like getting gifts. 
Yeah. I'm not giving that gifts to you. All right, here's two. Well, I always say the next best thing from receiving is giving. <laughs> it's supposed to maybe be the other way around. You want me to read? Please. Okay. Okay, y'all ready? <clears throat> Got kind of a small crowd. They're still coming in, but they lose, you win. Three, two, two, seven, six, three, six. All, All right. right. Oh, and the next one. Let me do, read the next one. Three, two, two, seven, six, four. It looks like one. You're just a. You're just. Are you? Are you a winner most of the time? I never win anything, <laughs> but I get to give it out. I'll take it from you. Yes, I just want to check you out to make sure you're right. <laughs> and I'm sure you are. There you go. Yes, that's a book that will help in finding happiness in God. Well, tomorrow night, our topic is burying the past. And then Wednesday night at 7 p.m., it's faith and fitness. And then we don't have a meeting Thursday night. And our final meeting will be Sabbath morning at 11.30 a.m. And that topic is End Time Prophets. So I hope you can come for our last three meetings. Tonight, Sister Amanda will be sharing with us a, another special music. And tonight she'll be singing Face to Face. Well, she won't be singing Face to Face. She'll be letting you know what she's going to be singing. Good evening. I'll be singing Faith is the Victory, because for the Remnant Church, faith is the victory. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise. And press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory.
Amen. Thank you, Sister Amanda. Tonight's topic, which church would Jesus join? Before we begin, shall we bow our heads for opening prayer? Father in heaven, we're very thankful that you allowed us to come to another Jesus on Prophecy meeting tonight. And we are praising you for everything that we've been learning we praise you, Father, for all that you do for us and mostly for sending Jesus down to die for us. Cover us with his blood, Father, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And now as we study your words, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would help us to understand and please use your manservant, Brother Dwight, speak through him, Father. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Things are winding down, aren't they? We got a few less people tonight, <clears throat> but I'm thankful for the ones that are here. To me, it's been kind of a bittersweet experience because, um, you know, it's a lot of work for, you know, we've got a whole team, as you know. We've got people that greet, we've got people that are working with the children, and uh, people that are running the sound system, and it's just, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of work, and um, it's a lot of work, but you know what? I, I don't know about all of you, but it's been a tremendous blessing for me. Have Amen. you all had a blessing? Amen. Whether you're a church, some of the staff is here, or whether you're not to me, I just want you to know I've, I've, been, I've been so blessed. Um, I'm tired, but a good tired, but I have been blessed, and to meet new friends, new people, and people that are searching. Um, I believe that it's not going to end. I, I think that as time gets shorter and it seems like things are wrapping up quicker, we need to know who we are, what we're doing, um, how we're going to get there, and make sure that we're willing to stand though the heavens fall. Amen? Okay. Um, so, tonight, which church would Jesus join? Where are we going to find any of the truths out? What have we been sharing? The Bible, right? The truth comes through the scriptures. Remember, not one text here or you know, one text over here, but the Bible says what? Here little, there little. Line upon line, what? Precept upon precept. And Isaiah 20 says, to the law and what? The testimony. What's a testimony? It's the word of God. To the law and the testimony, and the law is in the word too, if it speaks not according to this, how much light is in it? None. And I always, you know, and some people have said to me, well, Dwight, I mean, if there's truth in there, that's truth. And that is true. But if you take any number that's positive, I don't care if it's a million, and you multiply it by a negative, just a negative one, does that come out a positive or a negative number? If I take a one million times negative one, what do we get? Is it a positive one million or a negative one million? Negative. You see what I'm saying? In other words, the devil loves to mix truth and air up. But when you start mixing truth and air, what happens is it's not all truth. And the Lord said you're either what? For me or what? Against me. He didn't say, hey, as long as 75% truth, it's okay with me. You know, he'll take us anywhere we're at, but we need to know that he wants us to go all the way, and that's what we've been learning, what the scriptures say. In fact, this, this thing we've been learning, this if it's in the Bible, what? I believe it. If it disagrees with the Bible, it's what? Not for me. And I shared with you my favorite one is, um, what says the Bible to me? The teachings of men so mis often mislead us, so what says the Bible to me? Okay. And that's, that's really the, the key issue. we got to believe in something. We all believe in something. And if we do not believe in the scriptures, we are going to be bobbing around 
like a bobber on waves, just going to go back and forth, bobbling around if we don't have some kind of an anchor. And you know, there's a song that's a great song in, a, in, a, in hymnals, I think it's in most hymnals, will your anchor hold in the what? In the storms of strife. I think it's storms of strife, but life, that's good too, Ricky, it could be. But the bottom line is, is your anchor going to hold? Because the only way your anchor is going to hold is when? You're connected to, to Christ, and that's the point. And if we want to know about Jesus, we read his word, because the word became flesh. Okay. <clears throat> I put these words here, just like three little things as we get into this. A lot of people that I've talked to have asked me many times, that have been my friends that go to no church, but they believe in God, they say, do I, do I have to belong to a church? I mean, if I believe God, I've got some good friends, one, his name is Dave, but he's, he's often said, because he goes, he, he stays home, he used to go to church, but he said, all I see is a bunch of hypocrites in church. Why should I go to church? So I can be just as good of a Christian being at home that, that I can at church. And so we want to study that tonight a little bit. Do I have to belong to a church to be saved? Okay, the next one is, what's the purpose of the church? And it would seem pretty simple, but there again, a lot of people say, well, you know, I mean, if I could be a Christian at home, why spend all this money um, for all this stuff when I can be a Christian at home? Why, why do we need to have a church? What's, what's really the purpose? And of course, it kind of goes together. And then, is there really a true church? Because there again, and my grandma, my grandma uh, Jones, on my mom's side, I mean, she was a staunch Baptist, and, and of course, my mother had taken Bible studies. It's amazing how we became Seventh-day Adventists, by the way. I was young, and, and probably about four years or five years old, I don't really know when, but I remember going to the Baptist church, parts of it. But my mom... Um, was quite an arguer. She, and she was pretty good at it, and so she argued. Dad was very black and white, and I shared with you that Dad never went to church, and, um, you know, his name was Charles Darwin. That ought to give you a, a pretty good clue of, you know, his parents named him after Charles Darwin. So his name was Charles Darwin. Never, ever set foot in a church until he met my mother. My mom was a staunch Baptist, <laughs> And I mean, she was a staunch Baptist. She, she sang in the choir. She played the piano. She played for the church. She was very active in the Baptist church. Well, my Uncle Wayne, her brother, um, was quite a staunch Baptist also, but he went out to Colorado to go to college. And as he was going to college, back then in those days, many times, they would put ads in the paper. There'd be ads in the newspapers about staying with people, and they would get their room and board, and it would cost them so much. They didn't have the motels back then like we have today, or the apartment rentals, or all that. That's more of a new thing. And so back then, to, when he was off in Colorado, and he's from here in Michigan, he, he went out there, and he stayed with a couple, an older couple, and they were Seventh-day Adventists. And so as he's going to college, of course, Uncle Wayne is quite a debater. I think the whole, that whole family was big in debating, and anyway, he was quite a debater, very, very sharp, um, later on in life, worked a lot with, with the, um, what do I want to say, with, like, doing stuff with the mayor and the senators, he'd write letters, and he, he'd talk to me, I'd go out there to California, they moved out there, but during this time, he knew that these old people, they were very kind, and he just knew they were messed up, why in the world would you go to church on Saturday, what, I mean, why? That's no one's going to church. If you're, not, if you're not a Jew, why in the world would you go to church on Saturday? And so he was talking to my mom and said, I'm staying out with these people, and they're, they claim to be Seventh-day Adventists. I'd never heard them before, of them before, but he said, don't worry, Joyce. That's my mom's name. Don't worry, Joyce. I'm going to make sure before I get done with them, they'll be going to church on Sunday <laughs> because he's that sure of himself. Well, he started studying the Bible with them, and he loved the scriptures that he started going through the Bible with them. And you know what happened to him? Because he loved truth. It shocked him, but he became a Seventh-day Adventist. And guess what? Now he, he, he wrote to my mother and said, of course, this is where we were born, but he wrote to my mom and said, 
Joyce, I'm becoming Seventh-day Adventist, and you've got to study this out because you're, you're wrong. <laughs> my mom didn't like that. God can prove my mom wrong. And so he starts sending her lessons, stuff in the scriptures, and guess what? She became a Seventh-day Adventist, and that's how we became Adventists. And then my, my dad's brother that worked in the construction with him, they did. And anyway, it just kind of snowballed because they were willing and open for the truth. And it wasn't hard for dad. In fact, it was easy for dad never really going to any church. He was going to the Baptist church with mom, but he would be working basically seven days. He only went to church to please my mom, and as soon as he got out of church, he'd go back to work. I mean, he worked seven days a week, every, every week. But when, this, when he started studying with mom and this, he said, it just makes so much sense. It's what the Bible says. I mean, it's, it's easy to prove. It's just simple. And um, anyway, it, it boiled down to, are you willing to do what God wants you to do? That's the bottom line. Are you willing to search for truth and find truth, being, being willing to listen and, and discuss? Because we don't all agree on everything. We don't all agree, and I don't care if you're brothers or sisters or brothers and sisters in family. You don't always agree. But you need to be able to listen and be able to share. Both parties need to listen and share. Okay. John 10, 14 says this. I am the good what? And I know my what? And am known by my own. Now, I want you to, this, this is an important text here. This is a good starting, very important text in John 10, 14. It goes on, <coughs> it says, And other sheep I have which are not of this what? Okay, now think about that. So we go back, because this is so important. I am the good shepherd. So how many shepherds are there? One. There's not 10 or 20, there's one. One shepherd, and I know my what? I know my sheep. Who are the sheep? We are people that claim to do God's will. They're God's sheep. Is that not true? Okay, now, now think about that. But his sheep aren't the ones that claim to do God. Is there, is, there, is, there, is there wolves in sheep clothing? Yes, there are. So if you want to know what God, who Christ's sheep are, God's sheep, they're the ones that don't just claim to be a Christian. They're living the Christian life. They're, they're being like Jesus. And so he says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known by my own and other sheep I have which are not of this fold. What does that mean right there? He's got sheep or he's got people that's not of this fold. So is there one fold or two folds or five folds or ten folds? There's one fold. Okay, there's one fold. There's one fold, which means there's one church. That's what it's talking about. And he says, I, I, I have my sheep, and they know me, and I know them, but I don't have them just in my fold right now. There's other sheep in other folds. That's what he's trying to say. In other words, there's people in other churches, and there's people that's not even in church, and they're his sheep. They just don't, they're just not in the right fold yet, and that's what it's saying. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, and then it goes on and says, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one what? There will be one flock and one shepherd. And there's lots of places in the Bible, but I just thought this was a great place to start. In other words, Jesus is saying that I have my sheep, and my sheep hear my voice. But he's also saying, but I do have sheep that are not in this fold. Okay? But then he goes on and says, but them I also I must bring. Bring where? Where's he going to bring them? To his fold. Because they're, up, they're out there at other folds. He's going to bring them in to his way. Okay? And they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. When you find the truth, this is pretty good, when you find the truth, you look for a church that teaches the truth. Okay? In other words, you do not find truth by a church. That includes this church right here. Do you agree? How do you find truth? You don't just go to a church to find truth. You know, <clears throat> I was told by a friend um, that he, when he was going to seminary, that's been a number of years ago, but he had to do a study. They, they gave him a test. All the seminary students, they gave a test. And they had to go out and go to five different churches. And then they had to pick one out of those five churches, and they had to write uh, an essay on that church. 
and they had certain questions that they had to answer. And so this friend of mine told, said that he, he went, and he went to five churches, but he ended up going to this one church. It was, a, it was a beautiful, it was a big church. It was a beautiful church. He said, it was just gorgeous. He said, you went inside, and just, it just you stood in awe. It was just so beautiful inside. And he said, and he, said he sat down, because he went there, and he said, this is the church that I'm going to do my study on. And so he sits there, and he said, right on time. It was a timely church, and that impressed him. We should be on time. I mean, God's always on time. And so right on time, he said, the organist got up and started playing the organ, and he says, the minute that person started playing those keys, he knew he just didn't practice once every week. I mean, that guy practiced and practiced. I mean, it was just music he hadn't heard in a long, long time, if ever. He said it was just beautiful. And he said he got done, and then the choir, there was a big choir. He said they came up on the platform on their seats there, and they were standing, and he said the minute the conductor got up there and they started out, he said they were so beautiful. It's like, the, it's like heaven opened up. It was so beautiful. They were fantastic. And he said, I could tell those those people in the choir, they just didn't practice once a week. They practiced. They were, they were great. And he said, then he said the pastor got up and he gave a sermon. It was so, he articulated it so well. It was just, it was perfect. It was a perfect sermon. And um, he went home and he started thinking, but he, he didn't get all of his questions answered. So he went back the next week and he said, you know, I need to start asking uh, I need to find somebody, maybe a deacon or an elder or somebody, I need to find somebody that can answer me some questions. So the next Sunday he went there to church and he, he asked him, he, when it was over, he said, hey, um, he gave him his name and he said, here's what I'm doing, I've been given this assignment, I was here uh, last Sunday, but he said, I just have a question. He said, one of the questions I'm going to list, he went through the questions and most of them were answered, he said, one of the questions on my list is, how many people have you brought in from this church in the last 10 years? In other words, have you had any evangelistic meetings? Have you shared with anybody, doing any Bible studies, anything like that? And this deacon or elder, I don't know which one it was, I can't remember, but this leader in the church said, hung his head, he said, you know something? He said, I can't recall one person in the last 10 years that has come to this church because of any of our efforts. Now, the whole point of this story, it's a true story, the whole point of this story is this. You can go to a beautiful church and everything can be perfect. But, but one thing of God's church is if there's many sheep where not of this fold, if they're not bringing people in, it's the wrong church. Okay? You don't just go to a church because it's beautiful or because they've got lots of money or there's prestige. You do not find truth by a what? By a church. You find church, a church by what? Okay, this is something that you ought to memorize. You do not find truth by a church, but you find a church by the what? By the truth, and that's so important. John 10, 27 says, My sheep what? They hear my voice, and I know them, and they what? They follow me. In other words, you can't just say that it doesn't matter if I go to church or not, why I go to a church, because Jesus is saying that my sheep hear my what again? They hear his voice and know them, and they what? They follow me. And by the way, wouldn't it be kind of hard if you didn't have a church and we all, like individual atoms out there just doing our thing, how in the world would we gather money to give to missionaries overseas. How do you do that? Because you've got to have some kind of an organizational thing to be able to give money away. It's not that you can't give some, but I mean, you want to do something big. You want to do something together. How do you, how do you operate? How do, we, how do we have evangelistic meetings? How would I do it if I never came to any church? How would I, how would I get people together? You see what I'm saying? In other words, it's almost impossible. It's not that you can't believe in God. It's not that you can't worship God besides a church. It's that you need to belong to a church. You need to belong to the right church. But God is the one that instituted the church. Um, if, you, if, you, if you went back here, probably, let's, if, if I, it says, my sheep, my people hear my voice. And I want to see if I can, if, if it's in this one. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, John 10, 16, it says, them also, who must bring? Who's this talking? Who's the I? Jesus. I must bring, and they will hear whose voice again? Jesus' voice, and there will be what? One flock. It's a flock. It's not one sheep or one lamb. It's one flock. In other words, he's bringing a group of people together. That's his church that knows the truth. Okay, let's keep going. <clears throat> and I, this picture here is just to depict that all through the ages, Christ has always had his people. He's always had his sheep. Do you believe that? Yeah. Right, from, right from sin, from day one, Adam and Eve, and it goes on. And this is about the first thing, but remember, he made a call to anyone that would be his people. And what did he say? I'm going to give you 120 years basically to get your act together, but if not, I will be sending a flood. And those people listen right for a while, but 120 years is a long time. And people start thinking, oh, there's not going to be a flood. This Noah, and the guy's a looney tune, and he's building this boat, and he's not even building it in this lake. He's building it in the woods because he said he can get the trees there better. I mean, he, I mean how in the world is he going to get the boat from here onto the lake? Well, he said there's going to be a flood that's going to cover the world. But they couldn't picture that. And so they looked at everything scientifically, and believe me, they weren't stupid. I'll guarantee you they lose, used way more of their brains than we use today. And, but they brought up everything scientifically. But God had a people. He was calling everybody, but there was only a few. There was just a few that, that obeyed him. <clears throat> It says in the days of Noah, the majority rejected God's call, but God still had a few faithful people who entered the ark. Deuteronomy 11 one says, Therefore you shall love the Lord your God and keep his charges, his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments. What? Always. What? Always. What? Always. Always. Okay. Not 70% of the time. Can you be really, can you be a, a real Christian and be a Christian 70% of the time? No. Can't do that. Remember, the Lord says, you're either for me or you're against me. You know, there's a statement that I love, and I might mess it up, but I'll try. Ricky, I think you know the statement, and some of you might know it here. You've heard it. We've shared it before, but almost holy saved, but not holy saved, is not almost holy saved, but what? Holy lost. Did I confuse you? <laughs> Almost saved, almost wholly saved. In other words, let's just say 99% saved, but not what? 100% saved, not wholly saved, is not 99% saved, but what? 100% lost. Think about that. We, can, we cannot play church. When I, I, I mentioned when I came back to this church, um, or any church, but I studied, I said, I am not going to be a weekend warrior. I'm not going to be a weekend Christian. I'm going to study the Word of God. I'm not playing church. I'm tired of playing. I played church as I was growing up. I want to be a real Christian. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. I want to do what He wants me to do. And by God's grace, I mean, I have fumbled and stumbled many times, but I have never looked back. I'm still serious about my walk with God. I do not want to be a 99% Christian. Why do I want to do all that stuff and be 99% and be 1% of the devil because that 1% is not going to save me? You've got to be all Christ or you'll end up being what? Over here. You'll be none of Christ. And it's hard sometimes to imagine that, but Jesus is asking for all. He's saying, come to the foot of the cross. He's saying, I'm knocking on the door. Will you let me in? He's asking for everything. It's going to cost you everything. No money. doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, old or young, but it's going to cost you everything. And that's what was hard for me at, at that time. But I made that decision, and I, I've never looked back. And, and by the way, I've never been happier as a Christian. Yeah. I love being a Christian. And it's not always easy. You get made fun of and everything else, but it's not always easy. Okay. God has always had his chosen Peter, uh, people in 1 Peter 2, 9, in another one of my favorite texts, it says, but you are a chosen generation, a what? A royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own what? Special people. And I get that a lot. Again, I have a correlation in one of my messages that I share. I have, it's called special, pe special forces for special people because I was in the 
Special Forces, the Airborne Rangers. We had the best food that the, bar that, not the barracks, but that whole, um, oh, what I want to say, the, oh, uh, help me out, somebody. What is it? Um, ah, anyway, the, it was, it was, it was, I was at uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, but it was a whole base, the whole base. It wasn't just the, the Special Forces, the Airborne Rangers, but it was a whole base. People couldn't even come and eat at the Rangers. Now I could, because I had my, my military card, I could go to any other barry, or not barracks, but any other company, and I could eat. But only the Rangers could eat at the Ranger, at the mess hall there. Only. It didn't matter if you was an officer or not. You were the Rangers. They gave you the best food that they knew. Some of it was not really good, but in their, in their mind, they was giving you the best. We had the best sleeping bags, the lightest sleeping bags. They gave us the best packs. They were the lightest. We had the best clothing. In other words, I knew what it meant to be special in, a, in millions of people. They were special. They were, they were treated special. They had the toughest training, and um, it was every day, but they were, they were some special people. That's how it is with Jesus. You and I are, every one of you are special. Never, don't, never think that you're not special. You're, you're totally special. And so it says right here, but you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. It says that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his what? Marvelous. Marvelous light. And that's what we want. When you take a step to follow the truth, to become part of God's commandment, keeping people, you do not deny the, any truth that you believed in the past. Okay? While we may appreciate our past, we commit ourselves to following all the truth God has for us today. And again, that's a key issue. So many people want to be a 70% Christian or they want to follow so much and um, it's kind of like, what can, I, what can I get away with? And you might have heard this story, it comes to mind. This guy was going to hire a driver that, went, that worked in a national park. And um, where we lived out in Montana, we bordered Glacier National Park. And, and there's, have any of you ever been to Glacier Park? Anybody? Okay, so, you, so Kim, did you ever go to the, going to the Sun Road? Did you go up that, going to the Sun Road all the way? Okay, well, there's lots of hiking trails up there. And, of course, we lived very close to there, I mean, within a few miles. And we would go into Glacier Park lots of times on Sabbath, and we'd go hiking and stuff. But, but there are some pretty, when you get up there, it goes straight down, and there's not much of road. They have the rock cliff. And in fact, they tell you right before you start, I think um, the motorhomes can't be more than 30 foot long. You can't have big ones because you can't get around the sharp curves. It's steep. It goes straight down. They have a little wall that might be like this high that they have. Well, that ain't going to keep anybody off if they lose control. I mean, it's like, it's like a teaser in my opinion. But anyway, this company had to hire some of these drivers. And they have people they take up there in, in uh, big buses and trolley cars. They were red. Anyway, so... There was three people that, that this company was trying to hire, or not three people, but there was three interviews. And here was the question. The guy said, um, you're going up there and you've got all these guests, and they, of course they come to view the, the park here and the nice views. He said, how close would you get to the edge of the road with your, with your bus? And he said, well, he said, they got that wall there. He said, I would, be, I would probably be within a foot of that wall because I want them to make sure they could see over. And he said, okay. And um, so then he asked the next one and he was, they were talking. And the question came up, so if you were driving that bus up there and you go around some of those curves and stuff, I know there's a little bit of wall there, but how close would you come to that wall? And he said, you know what? He said, I think I could go within six inches of that wall with no problem. He said, the, the people pay and they want to, and he said, I'm a great driver. And he said, it'd be fine. The third one, he asked the same thing after they were talking. He said, if you were driving and you, had, you were going up there, if you got this job, how close would you come to the wall? He said, let me tell you something. I would stay away from that wall as much. I would hug the other side of the road. That's what I would do. Who do you think got the job? <laughs> God, okay. Very good. In other words, in other words you don't want to just get by with what you can get by. Stay on the truth as far as you can get. Okay. While we may appreciate our past, we commit ourselves to following all the truth God has for us today. 1 Timothy 3.15 says, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of God, which is the what? 
the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. The New Testament disciples and Christians knew how important it was to have a church. I mean, Paul would go out there, he'd evangelize, and he'd go and he'd get things started, and they'd have deacons and elders and deaconesses they would get in. And back then, the elders and the deacons would preach. Paul would be there for a while, then he would go work on others, and he would end up coming back. But they had to have a group. You've got to have some organization to grow a group. Otherwise, how do you grow? It's impossible. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is what? And what does sanctify mean? Set apart. Set apart. So if you're following the truth, I promise you, you probably won't, if you're really following the truth, you probably won't be like every other Christian. Now, I want to share something else with you. It doesn't make you better. Okay? I'm just telling you right now. It does not make you better. It makes you more responsible. Amen? But it doesn't make you better. Not, no one is better in the eyes of God. He loves everybody the same. But if you consider yourself a real Christian, then you ought to do the works of a real Christian because you love Jesus, not because you're going to merit salvation, but you're going to do the works of the Christian by faith because you love Jesus and you have more responsibility. Why? Because you claim to be a real Christian. <clears throat> That's very, very important. So you'll be set apart. People could make fun of you. They'll say things. But we should never, ever look to the left nor the right. If you know what's true, it shouldn't matter. I'd rather be judged by God than judged by people, wouldn't you? Because people can get pretty prejudiced. John 8, 32 says, And you shall know the truth, and the what? The truth shall make you free. Okay. If we approach God's word only, desiring to prove our position, we will not discover his will. Our own thoughts will influence what we read in his word. I have studied with lots of people um, in the past and, you know, do Bible studies or just study. I mean, um, I'm, I'm probably some, I call it some deep things, really getting into some, some deeper things. And, and I'm a strong, listen, I am, anybody that knows me, I'm a pretty strong-minded person. But we need to learn to listen to other people and then go check those things out. But I've met a lot of people that just, will not, they, they hear you, but they don't really listen to you. You know what I'm saying? They hear you, but they don't really listen to you. They, they've got their own agenda. They might not realize it, but they just don't, they, they, it's like, no, you can't tell me anything. Now, they don't say it openly. Some, sometimes they do. But most of the time they don't. We need to be open. <clears throat> okay, Revelation chapter 12, we talked about this on uh, Sabbath evening. This lady here, this, this, in this uh, vision in Revelation, um, what is she standing on? She's standing on the moon. Does the moon give any light of itself? No, no it only reflects. So who's, 